happy days. Glory to God. He's good all the time. How's everybody tonight? Are you blessed and highly flavored? We're the salt of the world. We are not the pepper. Amen? We are the salt. We are not MSG. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 is just for you. Glory, glory, glory. Are you anticipating something to happen? Every moment of your life, if you're a Christian, something is always getting ready to happen. <laughs> Why? Because God is always getting ready to do something with us. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. <clears throat> Is everybody there? Let's speak it. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, we can all go home now. <laughs> Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. How many of y'all know it's God's desire that we think the way he thinks? How about to see the way he sees things? Amen. Uh, verse 6. Who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking a form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. I'm going to repeat that again. He humbled himself and he became obedient. Obedient to the point of what? Death. Even to the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. How many of y'all want favor? Well, he just gave it to us. He said, you got to humble yourself and become obedient to death. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. Three-dimensional. So when you mention the name of Jesus, every location is affected. Amen. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I want you to understand here that salvation is attached to what we call destiny. So what he's saying, work out your destiny with fear and trembling. That means you must work it out. For it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his what? For his good pleasure. So he wants us to have the mind, the thoughts, and purposes of Christ. They must be activated in us at all times. But he says you got to be, you got to maintain a place of humbleness and obedience to death if you want my favor. So you're not working out your own salvation, which in another way you are, but if you're working out your salvation, you're working out your destiny. Amen? With humility and obedience. Now, in this, it says, and work it out with fear and trembling, which is honor, respect, and reverence to the Lord, the King, Creator, and friend. And friend. Amen? In this area, we call this the road to destiny. So when you're working out something, you're on your path or on the road to destiny. Is everybody okay? It's not always a fulfillment. It's a mission. Yeah. 
Destiny is a position. So many people are trying to fulfill their destiny, but you can't, if, you, if you're not in position, you can't fulfill it. So the road to destiny is not just a fulfillment, but a mission with multiple stops on the road. How many of y'all know you can go down multiple times a road, man? You can go down digestive lane. You know, you can go down a smooth pass. You can get on the highway where you're cruising, pedal to the metal and don't look back, you know. And then you can go into places where there's winding and turning roads. So the road to destiny has multiple roads that you and I will go on. And sometimes it seems like we're off road. Things seem to be stumbling, things to be, but it doesn't mean you're not fulfilled, you're not going, you're still on the road of destiny. Sometimes God will take you off the road to bring you through a trial. And it doesn't mean you've done anything bad. Does everybody understand that? He's preparing us for everything. There's something that Paul said. He said, I became many things that many could be saved. So we must be able to put on whatever he puts on us to be wherever we are so that we can communicate whoever is needed. Amen? Again, there's some smooth roads, very bumpy and so forth. Destiny starts at your new birth in Christ with gathered information from your past experiences. Does everybody understand it? But these are now all submitted under the rule of Christ. Everyone has past experiences, but when you became born again of the Spirit, amen, your destiny is now starting because other than that, you were on your own. True destiny is established by heaven. That's true destiny. Is everybody okay? Go to Acts 9. You know, when people first get saved, they want to do all kinds of things for Jesus. And Jesus saying, ask them to do nothing. The only thing he's asking them to do is to become like him more. <laughs> I want to do this for Jesus. I want to do that. I, I, want to, I was the same way. Until he kept saying, not now. When you hear that enough, you finally surrender. Okay, you got it. I'm done. See, we have a tendency to want to show God how much we love him by works. But he wants us to show how much we love him by obedience. Amen. Works has nothing to do with it. It's obedience. It doesn't matter what you've done for, for him, he's still looking for obedience because it's not counted unless he sent you to do it. Amen? So we must know his timing. Acts 9, verse 1. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, though that if he found anyone who were of the way, whether men, women, or children, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem so that they might be killed or put in prison. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And what happened? Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, this is powerful because Saul's self-imposed destiny was interrupted. It was interrupted by God. God sent him an invitation. Obviously, he rejected it multiple times. So he had to slap him off his horse. Said, I got an offer you can't refuse, homie. He was interrupted on the road of false destiny to turn into the pathway of the road to true destiny. 
Amen. And Paul said, and he said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I believe God got his attention. Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So he was not, he was not concerned at this moment of anything that he was supposed to do for God in the long run. He was interested in what he needed to do for God right now. Amen? So his destiny, he didn't even realize that he'd already stepped into his destiny. He didn't know what was going on. The only thing was is he was blinded. Amen? But everything that he was ambitious to do just got halted. His whole plans, everything about his life to where he got into that position as a Pharisee, all of his education, everything he learned, everything he did for God that he thought he was doing for God just got halted. Everything stopped in his life to get redirected on the right road. In verse 7, and a man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Now, this is powerful. This is where Saul, who was self-imposed destiny, always leading himself, thought he knew everything. All of this education, everything just dropped. And now he had to be led. He had to humble himself and stick out a hand and say, help me. This is how destiny starts. Amen. Destiny continues when you stay that way. Amen. Destiny gets altered when you pull back your hand and say, I got it. That's when destiny changes or it's put on hold. Is everybody okay? In verse 9, and he was three days. Oh, verse 7? No. So, verse 9. And he was there, what? Three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So God put him on a fast, and he didn't really want to. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said, arise and go to the street called what? Well, man, he was already on a street called Crooked. Amen? Amen? And God halted everything, interrupted, and said, let's get, on, let's get straight here. Let's get this going straight now because you're on a wrong path. Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire of the house of Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. <laughs> and in a vision, you know, he was praying for his life. He never prayed like he prayed. <laughs> And in the vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might, what? Receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man and how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. He had a reputation. Same thing when Jesus had a reputation. He was only known as a carpenter or Mary's son or Joseph's son. When your destiny starts, they will still try to recognize you as an old person of the old past, old character, old attributes. But God says you can't look at them no more. You're going to move on. In verse 14, and he had authority from the chief priests to bind all who are called on your name. But the Lord said to them, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road 
<laughs> as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He could not go to the next part without being filled with the Holy Spirit. People are still trying to fulfill destiny without being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's an area where we must maintain being filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he was, arose and, bab, and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Powerful. Powerful interruption. Went from crooked street to straight street. <laughs> A complete shift of life that can happen multiple times on our road. Does anybody get it? It can happen multiple times where God intervenes, puts a halt to something, changes something. Because we have a tendency to, even as we start on the road, to start picking up, compromising. Well, this must be it. Well, the, maybe this is it. Well, maybe I should, maybe I should do, no, maybe, there's a lot of maybes on this road. And all maybes must be removed. We do not live in assumption on this road. We live on absolutes. Amen? Is everybody okay? So Saul was actually blinded to any direction. <laughs> he had nowhere to go. Until the outstretched hand of the Lord was extended through his servants. <laughs> he had to let go of all human reasoning, feeling, understanding. A no longer self-guided, but eternally guided. The destiny, the road to destiny for me and you is a constant eternal guidance. Not a human guidance. Amen? 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. <laughs> Hallelujah. In verse 15. Praise God. The Lord is speaking to Elijah. In verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go return to your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king of, over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nisha as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Japh, uh, Shaphat of Ebel Moah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Obviously, God was telling him, you going home. <clears throat> and it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, jo Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. So he was not only a prophet, but a hitman. For the king. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12. Now I want you to understand something, that if you had 12, ox of, 12 yoke of oxen, you were a wealthy individual. This was his livelihood now. This was his equipment. He was totally dependent on this to bring money to himself and to the household of the family he was at. Amen? Does everybody understand? Hallelujah. And, uh, oh, hallelujah. In verse 18, yet I have reser reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, 
and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shephat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the twelve. Then Elijah passed by him and did what? Threw his mantle on him. They had a strange way of calling, you know. It's like throw somebody, hit him with something, and you get their attention. We do that with water for life. No. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Elijah throws his mantle on Elisha because he was calling him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Does everybody see it? And said, please let me kiss my mother or my father and my mother and then I will follow you. And of course, Elijah said to him, go back again. Go back again. For what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Now this is so powerful. Talk about an interruption in somebody's self-destiny. I mean, come on, he had everything he wanted. Wealthy, didn't need anything. Of course, he knew about Elijah, amen, and what he had done, that God had already parted in him a desire to follow him. He already imparted in him to be like him. And next thing he knows, he shows up and says, you're called to what? Fulfill a purpose and a destiny. I'm giving you a new purpose. You'll no longer lean on the oxen. You'll no longer lean on the equipment. You'll no longer lean on your family. You'll no longer lean on anything that is associated with this world. You will now lean on me. This is how we will fulfill our destiny. No leaning on nothing, only on him. Amen? So what did he do? Well, <laughs> he burned it. He, he, for him to commit and show that he meant it, he destroyed the equipment. And then he killed the animals <laughs> and offered them up and ate them. But he shared it all with everyone else. And then it says, he was no longer a servant to the temporary, but a servant to the eternal. With a mentor for equipping of destiny, Again, we have a calling, we have a purpose, and we have a destiny. Many try to fill or fulfill destiny without a heart purpose. They try to step into other people's paths and shoes when God has a specific purpose for each and every one of us. Not that he doesn't put us with a mentor to follow so that things could be placed down and transferred. Does everybody understand? But in that, the talents and abilities that God imparts, the wisdom and knowledge that he imparts, so that everything that you and I do always represents a Christ character, but we can become many things for Christ. Is everybody okay? Hallelujah. Now, uh, 1 Timothy 6. This can, a destiny is never, eternal destiny is never driven or motivated for money. It's never driven by money. Amen? Must first reach the righteous purpose. And of course, that should always be to please God. 1 Timothy 6. When God calls, he provides. Amen? Now he may do it in a strange way. But he does make a way. If we're in position, we get it. If we're not, we miss it. 
1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Road to destiny. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be what? Content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, man or woman of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called and have confidence the, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Powerful. So he warns us, look at, do not let love, uh, money become your destiny. Amen? That's not a destiny. It's money-driven destiny is always destructive. Amen? There's nothing wrong with having money. Amen? But when, it's, when a destiny is driven by money, then it becomes destructive because it opens the door every evil thing possible. In Matthew 7, You know, you can tell sometimes that your road is shifting. It can become bumpy. It can become challenging. It can seem like you're going uphill. It seems sometimes that there's curves. It seems, but then there's a place where you know you're going downhill. yoo all the way down, man. You're skiing all the way down. And then sometimes you come to a smooth stop or a dead stop. Matthew 7, verse 13. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but in really they are ravenous wolves. In other words, beware of influence. Beware of what you hear. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice what? Lawlessness. Self-fulfilled destiny. In other words, God was allowing them to do whatever. Does everybody understand it? He might have been there, but he wasn't with them. There's a difference. The worst thing that you and I can do is be successful in the wrong assignment. Amen? Verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, here's the conclusion, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock, which is a representation of the anointing. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like in a foolish man who built his house on sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that people were astonished at his teaching. 
for he taught them as one having authority and not as of the scribes. Again, road to destiny is narrow and difficult. Again, we've got to relinquish ourselves and replenish ourselves. Relinquish ourselves from worldly influence and replenish ourselves constantly with godly influence. That's why he warns us to be careful who you associate with. Amen? We've got to replenish ourselves all the time by being filled with the Spirit and the Word of God. With complete submission and cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Now, what he begins to do is take possession of our heart and mind. The Holy Spirit will begin to take possession of your heart and of your mind as you continue to cooperate. Establishing a pure motive and a grateful attitude. So many times we're, we're trying to look to find out what we're supposed to do when we are already doing it. Is everybody with me? He says that if you seek him with all of your heart, amen, he'll establish your steps and your thoughts. The enemy is the one that always tries to bring carnal reasoning. So, so many times we may be thinking, gosh, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Just for you to consider it, you usually are. You just don't realize it. Because he's got control, and you and I don't. Amen. <laughs> In 1 Peter chapter 1. Road to destiny. What road are you on today? Verse 3, let's speak it. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for us who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been what? Grieved. By what? Various testing. Hello? Various molding. That the genuineness of your faith... Or your connection being much more precious than gold that perishes. Though it is tested by fire may be found to the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having you, you not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy unexpressibly and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Various trials are not always off course but many times are on course. Amen? If you are a seeker of his, will, of his will and his desire, just because you're going through stuff doesn't mean you're off course. Everybody goes through it, no matter what it may be. It could be hardship. It could be offense. It could be a need. What he's always doing is he putting us on the potter's wheel. So that he's always, God is a remolder all the time. He, that's a wonderful thing about him is we can restart, reboot, and reconnect anytime. That's why when we cry out those days, Lord, give me a pure heart. When we realize our fruits, fruits starting to stink a little bit or, you know, we're getting a little off course with our fruits, that's what will lead you off course if you stay there. But if you recognize it, then you get to exchange a heart. You get to do something about it through cooperation of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's many times that we might have missed a direction. Turn left here instead of going straight. You know, I told you about that a couple blocks back. Oh, sorry. 
and we repent, you know, or we get convicted about something. See, when we're on this road of destiny, it's no longer just conviction of sin. It's conviction of missing it. Does everybody get it? See, it's not a conviction of sin. It's a missing conviction. You missed it. Gosh, I got convicted for that. Whoa. Sorry, Lord. Somebody understand. What's he trying to do? I want you to hear better. I want you to be more sensitive to these things. Because so many times we begin to, again, lean on our emotion, lean on our circumstances, lean on the things we see, lean on assumption, lean on the past. All of these areas we begin to lean on. And he's saying, stop leaning on anything. Lean on me. You judge by what? Fruit. But are judged by your, fir your fruit first. Amen? Hebrew. Hebrew 10. Again, if you are a seeker of his will and desire... You're going to step in what you need to step into. Verse 32. Hebrews 10, 32. Is everybody okay? How are you getting this? <laughs> I just heard, because uh, so many times we say, we think we're bad. We think we've done something bad because of the trial. What did I do to bring us on me, Lord? Nothing. Does everybody get it? Now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. <laughs> we do stuff to bring us on, you know. <laughs> and he'll let you know. Verse 32. But recall the former days in which after you were what? Illuminated, you endured great struggle with suffering. Now, check this out. You were illuminated. And then you what? Then you <laughs> endured great suffering. You know, the enemy always loves to come and steal what just happened. I mean, you get this powerful revelation. Next thing you know, two days later, you're like, what the heck happened? I mean, did I just get thrown out of the throne or what? Did they get dropped off at the corner? You know? You're going for this great ride on the smooth road. Next thing you know, phew, it's like you've been laying in the trunk and threw a bouncy road or something. But God has his ways. Remember, his ways are higher than ours. What he wants us to get us into a place where we stop trying to figure it out and try and trust it out. Amen. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. But recall the former days in which after you illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering, partly while you were made a spectacle, but by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were, <laughs> were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my change and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves where? In heaven. Because we should all, destiny is also associated with heavenly bound, not earthly bound. There do, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of what? Endurance. So that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Oh, goodness, that needs to be highlighted. So after you have done the will, in other words, after you've humbled and obedient to what he's asked you to do, I'm not talking long term, I'm talking short term. He asked you to do something today. And it may take a few days to do. After you've completed it, the promise is released. Now, you don't know where the promise is going to manifest. Does everybody get it? But it is there. 
Somewhere, somehow, something is happening. Could be an answer prayer, healing, all of a sudden, prosperity. Anything can happen. The promise is released. In other words, it's out of his hands now. It's been sent to you. So when it's being sent to us, what we need to do is maintain our position with constant warfare. Amen. Constant submission, because the word says submit to God to resist the devil. Amen. So that we're battling to stay in position to receive that promise. That's why we bind and loose. We bind the powers of darkness even coming against the angels working on our behalf because they're the ones that are bringing the promises to you and me. So we intercede for the angels working on our behalf. Every day I bind the powers of darkness that will come against the angels working on my behalf. Amen? Does everybody understand? Cool. Hallelujah. Therefore, verse 35, do not cast away your confidence. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Which has great reward for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just live by what? Faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. For we are not those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe in the saving of the soul. Hallelujah. Endurance. When we need to endure to overcome and go through, especially rejections or disappointments, mistakes, lack, sickness. Hello, welcome to the earth. <laughs> what he doesn't want us to do is maintain, go back, but maintain course no matter what. Grabbing hold of your Call your purpose and destiny and the future promises that God has for us. Completing each task that has been dedicated to us to receive the promise, this adds to our destiny. Does everybody get this? This adds to our destiny. When the promise is released, it's always being added to our destiny. Hebrews 12. In verse 1, Hebrews 12, verse 1. Let's speak it. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and a sin which so easily ensnares us. Did you hear that? <laughs> weight, burden, hello? Which can become sin, which easily ensnares us. So he warns us, these things easily ensnare us. What do they do? They mislead us. And let us run with what? Endurance, the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as a what? Son. My son, do not despise chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chasten us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his what? Of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. It's supposed to be painful. Why? Because pain has a, an, uh, 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 an area to where it's remembered. 
Does everybody got it? We remember pain more than we do joy. Does everybody get that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Nevertheless, after it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been what? Been trained by, you know, you can be trained by pain. Don't do that again. Amen. I remember that. <laughs> Endure, rebuking, correction, chastening, pain, suffering, trials. They're to train us. You know, if we begin to look at, stop looking at what we've done wrong and start looking at what God is doing, we'd have more joy. I mean, if you really, if, if there's something that you made, you did mistake out of God's time or something, whatever it is, you, Lord, forgive me. He's forgiven you. The problem is we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. Because the old man is still there, man. He can't shut up. When you, when you mess up, he doesn't shut up. <laughs> and and it, one of the things that we've got to, many fall off course, and this is why. <laughs> they can't deny their selfish emotions. They have a hard time denying their how they feel. They keep letting that feeling. I feel like this. So what? Bury it. So they'll go off course. Amen? By selfish emotions. <laughs> it will cause a delay. But God will chasten us. <laughs> Sometimes we just got to eat a little bit more dirt. <laughs> Instead of throwing it on us, we have to eat it, you know. <laughs> we have to get thrown, dragged through the bushes to awaken. Everything is about being awakened in this so that we're alert and we're sensitive and we're consistent. Hallelujah. Philippians 1. You know, I'm, selfish emotions remind me of <clears throat> a person driving and they have a passenger. It's called self. And they're driving and they're just disgusting. They're so caught up in how they feel with one another that they just ran a red light, a stop sign, and ran over three people. And they're still talking. And people are dead in the road, man. That's what selfish emotions will do. They'll run over everything and anyone to get a fulfillment. Oh, they're so caught up in that conversation. Who cares? And it brings people right off, right off the road, right off track. Can put you right on the crooked street. Unless you recognize it and get back on. Philippians 1, verse 19. That's why it's good to have the navigator with you. Holy Spirit. <laughs> verse 19, let's speak it. Is everybody there? For I know that this will turn out for many my deliverance through your prayer and the su supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope in nothing, that in nothing I shall be what? Ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live is Christ. How many of y'all know God wants to get us to that position? And to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am what? Hard pressed between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Now, here is a powerful key. On our destiny, we will maintain this destiny if we keep that attitude. To be home is far much better than to be here. Amen? 
no matter what your circumstances are, to be home is far much better to be here. But such and such need me. My family needs me. This and that. And with an attitude to be home is far much better than to be here. God sustained you here. Because your focus is not here anymore. It's home. Jesus' focus was sustained home to maintain here. Does everybody get that? He was the prime example of it. That's why he connected all the time. What was the first thing that happened when he took, when he ran away from home? Or, the, or the, when they were traveling? Where did they find him? They even, I mean, they were so caught up in their emotional self. So they forgot they left their kid. They left God behind. <laughs> I think he was fully taken care of. But when they finally turned back and followed him, where have you been? I've been about my father's business. Come on with me, Junior. You know, it's not time yet. But that's, he was always heavenly bound. Everything about him was home. And that's what God wants for me and you. Everything about us should be home. So to be better to be home is what's going to sustain me here. Oh, gosh. I get excited talking about home. <laughs> Glory. All right, where was I? Oh, sure, you're all following along, huh? Thank you. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Powerful. To live is Christ. That's their level, man. That's master's level. That's third level thinking. That's master level thinking. 2 Corinthians 4. In verse 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. <sighs> Let's speak it. But we have this earth and tr this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not us. We are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down and not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. Knowing what? That he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not what? We don't lose heart. We don't give up. We don't lose focus. And we don't off-road. Amen? Hmm. Why? For even though our outward man is what? Is perishing yet in the inward man is being what? Renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, said a moment. For some of us, we always agree with the enemy that is this lasting forever? No, in the, guys, in the eyes of God, it's a moment. For our light affliction was just for a moment, is working for us. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I think everybody that's going through stuff needs to read this right here. 
Amen? Instead of going to the phone, Twitter, Facebook. Hello? <laughs> for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. A far more exceeding the eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen. See, if we keep looking at the things that are seen and judging by everything we see, you will stay in that moment. For more, 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 more moment. It would be a big moment. But at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are what? Temporary, but the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. Wow. So the enemy always tries to keep you on the moment of the scene, that self, selfish, emotional scene. You know, one of the things is disappointment. Amen? Well, it didn't happen the way I wanted it to. Well, stay on course, and things will turn out. How many of you all, all know God's got something better all the time? If we'll think that way, amen? Well, I guess I didn't, I didn't, I guess I missed this. I guess I did, I did. Maybe God said, look at not now. I got something better. Why take what's good when you can have the best? We are king's kids, amen? Oh, happy days. Thank you, Lord. Let's go somewhere, okay? <laughs> Let's go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he himself gave some to be what? Apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. For what? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a what? To a what? A perfect man in a perfect position. Which means a perfect destiny. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of emotion, doctrine, by trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working, by which every part does its share. Causes what? Causes what? Growth. Isn't that wonderful? Causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Becoming the perfect person in Christ, not self, not, uh, uh, not in your mirror, amen. It's got nothing to do with how you look. Not abilities, not talents, but character. But character. Wisdom and discernment. Taught by the anointing of Christ. Ephesians 6. In verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be what? Be strong. Praise God. In the Lord and in, his, and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the trickery, the misleading of the devil and the lies. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Amen. Be ready to fight in the spirit. Be ready in season and out. Amen. Be consistent. Exchange the things you need to exchange. 
In other words, when there's an area that's going on in your life that it just doesn't seem to be working, exchange it. You can bind loose whatever it is, exchange it. Amen? Exchange the temporary for the eternal. Exchange your wisdom for his wisdom. We need wisdom always in the constant area, especially with discernment. We need it constantly. I'm going to close in Hebrews 3. Hebrew 3, verse 1. Is there everybody there? Therefore, what? Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who anointed him, as Moses also was faithful in his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all of his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as son over his own house, whose house we are if, whose house we are if, we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, firm to the what? To the end. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will what? If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. In a day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation. I said, they always go astray where? In their heart. And they have not known my ways. In other words, they've been off course. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled, indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. So you and I are to be partakers of Christ if we hold fast to the end. To obey is to cooperate with full exchange of life for life to maintain a road to destiny. Remember, destiny is a position. Amen? Where Christ's character is fulfilled. Remember, he said, we can become many things to rescue many individuals. He will always put us on that potter's wheel. Nobody escapes it. You're either on it or you're off it or you're going back on it again. Welcome to the earth. Welcome to the training ground for eternal life. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. And every word and seed that's been planted tonight, let it be protected by the blood and grow and bear fruit for your glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.